Good evening, everyone. Thank you all for uh, joining us. My name is, for those of you that don't know me, is Fatin Goshen. I am the head of the Department of Government here at the University of Essex. And I want to welcome you and thank you all for joining us both in person. I'm not sure how many yet are on Zoom, but about 100 people signed up. So we're excited to welcome them um, as well, wherever they're at, because it's all over. Um, so welcome um, to our uh, inaugural Blondell Lecture Series. Um, we are delighted um, to host this event with the European Consortium for Political Research. I'm gonna leave it to my colleague, uh, Dr. David Powell, um, who's the chair of ECPR, to discuss how the initiative um, came to be. But before I turn it over to him, I want to say just a few words about the late and legendary uh, Professor John Blondell and the Department of uh, Government. Now, his longtime friend and colleague, Emeritus Professor Ian Budge, described John, and I quote, and I love this quote when I read it the first time, it stuck with me as a Napoleonic figure who reshaped European political science both structurally and intellectually and had a general influence on the discipline through the world. So for many of us, uh, for many of us here in the Department of Government uh, at the University of Essex, John was our founding head of department from and, and stayed at Essex from 1964 to 1984. And during this time, he not only helped establish our reputation uh, as one of UK's leading universities for political science, he also dis uh, defined our distinguished approach, which we still carry to today. Uh, today, the Department of Government is still one of the top uh, leading political science departments or politics department, as people here in the UK like to say. I'm sorry, I'm from the US, so we say political science. And home to the only Regis professorship um, in politics in the UK, which is held by our own professor, uh, Christian uh, Gledich. Now, in the spirit of many of John's uh, initiatives, uh, I'm delighted to announce that on December 14, the Department of Government will be launching our Crisis Research and Recovery um, Lab with a panel discussion with the President and CEO of Crisis Group, Dr. Comfort um, Eero what we're calling C2R for short, um, will partner with strategic end users to become the go-to entity in the UK and beyond for end user informing research on crises home and abroad, and of course, um, how to recover as well. So before I pass it on to David, we decided we'd keep these very short. I didn't time myself, but I, I was supposed to speak less than two minutes. So hopefully I did that. I just want to thank my colleagues, Dr. Rabia Malik and Dr. Diane Boulay and our financial officer, Elliot Breery and um, Helen and Tanya from ECPR um, for their invaluable uh, help and support to make sure this happened. So thank you again for joining us. Thank you, Fatin. Thanks for organising this wonderful event. And it's great to see such a, a terrific crowd here and I believe also um, online. So my name is David Farrell and uh, for my sins, I'm the chair of the ECPR. Um, and it's my great pleasure to be involved in this joint endeavour, uh, this first of hopefully many uh, joint endeavours um, together today. So um, the origins, the origins are with this gentleman over here, Shane Martin. Shane and I were in the room together when Jean was given the um, Lifetime Achievement Award by the ECPR in 2022. And uh, we were having a bit of a discussion on the fringes and sort of saying, you know, it's, there's such a shared history between the two of us. Wouldn't it be great to think of doing something in Jean's, in Jean's honour? And so today we've, we've come, come along quite a way with the idea of this um, annual lecture. So... You've already given the story, Fatin, and I mean, his key role in founding what is one of Europe's leading political science departments and the founding of one of the world's largest political science associations. I mean, what a legacy. It's all the other things that were noted in his Lifetime Achievement Award, but just those two things alone. And of course, two things that our respective organizations share in common. Because the ECPR, from what I understand from the history, emerged in a broom cupboard somewhere in the bowels of the Department of Government. It was a really tiny little mom and pop sort of operation. And, and obviously it's expanded. We outgrew what was available here in, in Essex and we moved elsewhere. We're now located in Harbour House, just down the road. And so in a sense, the friendships have kind of waned a bit, to be frank, between our two respective organizations. So this, more than anything else, to see some familiar faces from the Department of Government 
some of Shijan's former colleagues and, and others who've joined since. It's just a wonderful opportunity to rekindle old, old friendships. So I'm going to hand over to Shane, who's going to introduce our wonderful speaker, and I'm greatly looking forward to hearing the presentation. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, David. Um, and we will get to the science in a, in a moment, I absolutely promise you. Um, so it's, it's my honour and, and pleasure to introduce uh, the first speaker in the Blondell Lecture Series, uh, Professor Carolina Plessia, uh, is Associate Professor in the Department of Government at the University of Vienna. Uh, she holds a grant from the Austrian Science Fund. It's such a wintry evening, I, I keep wanting to say Australian uh, Science Fund. Uh, to study, but it's Austrian, to study voters' reaction to political compromise. And she is the principal investigator of the ERC-funded project, Devote. And that project aims to develop and apply a new theoretical and methodological approach to study what voting means for ordinary citizens in both established democracies and electoral autocracies. For her work on public opinion, electoral behavior, and experimental methods, she has received numerous awards, including the ECPR Jean Blondel PhD Prize in 2014, and more recently, the Gordon Smith and Vincent Wright Memorial Prize. She is part of the Austrian National Election Study, the Austrian Corona Panel Project, and the Austrian Academy of Sciences, and has published, impressively, more than 40 peer-reviewed articles. And her research has appeared in leading journals such as Comparative Political Studies, the European Journal of Political Research, the flagship journal of the ECPR, as we will all, all know, and Political Psychology, amongst others. And she is author of the Split Ticket Voting, she is author of Split Ticket Voting in Mixed Member Electoral Systems, a theoretical and methodological investigation published by our very own ECPR Press in 2016. So a very warm welcome to Essex, and we're really looking forward to your lecture. Good evening, everyone. Thanks a lot for the nice introduction. And I'm glad you stick to the Austrian rather than the Australian. But you're not the only one getting confused. So that's fine. Um, it's truly an honor to be here. It's, it's a, an enormous, I feel very privileged to be able and have the opportunity to kickstart the um, lecture series in, in honor of Jean Blondel. And um, in this 20, 25 minutes presentation, what I'd like to do is to first um, relate my research to the pioneering work that Jean Blondet did, um, and then zoom in into a bit more into my ERC uh, starting grant project, and then conclude maybe with just a few thoughts and a brief discussion about where I think the, the discipline is and maybe the future directions. And I'd like to start with um, a sentence that I think um, um, expresses really well my, 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 my thought and my feeling when I think about personality like Jean Blondel. Um, it's, it's this uh, important, so the impact that personalities and giants like Jean Blondel can have on, on researchers like me, because they build those foundation on which we can build upon. I mean, I did one year of my master at the University of Essex, and I learned immensely precisely uh, because of the quantitative focus and the, the, the type of um, innovative research that is being done here. And I want to give you three examples of my a bit more past research that I think aligns really well with the foundations that giant like Jean Blondet have um, created for us. Um, yeah, this, this summarizes a little bit uh, my, my past research as a first example, as also Shane has, has mentioned, my PhD dissertation, which I did in Trinity College, Dublin, under the supervision of Professor Michael Marsh and Kenneth Benoit. Um, I study voting behavior under mixed electoral systems. And as uh, Bernard in 2018 put very elegantly, uh, the, the mixed systems are um, an intriguing um, institutional animal. They allow voters to cast two votes at the same time to elect the same legislative body. In this case, for my PhD dissertations, the lower houses. And so it's, it's a sort of like um, quasi-experimental setting in which we can 
study um, how people allocate these two votes that they have available. They have one vote for a party and one vote for a candidate. Now the existing literature has sort of assumed before I um, started my PhD dissertation that when people split their ticket, they do it for strategic reasons. But actually the work I conducted and was both a methodological and a theoretical investigation in, 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 in several countries in Europe and elsewhere, including New Zealand, South Korea, Japan, etc. I looked into the possibility that actually people when they split their ticket, they, they don't do that just for strategic reasons. Actually, um, a lot as, as quite a few people in multi-party systems hold uh, preferences for more than one party um, similarly. And actually the mix system, so having the possibility to cast these two votes allows them to express these preferences, this ambivalence, if you want to call it that way. Um, and this also emphasizes the ability of voters to deal with complex electoral rules such as those of mixed systems. And this has resulted in a book that was published by the ECPR Press and also the Jean Blondet Prize Award that I have received. Another example is um, related to my work on um, partisan bias and whether people can um, um, hold parties accountable for what they do while they are in government. And in a series of um, papers that I published with Professor Kritz Silvia Kritzinger at the University of Vienna, we started to look into the possibility that also opposition parties, not only parties in government, um, will be held accountable for what they do while in, in their tenure, so why they are in parliament. And in fact, um, it seems to be the case in several countries uh, opposition parties are not immune to voters' judgment during election time. A last example is from my research on the winner-loser gap. And this is, this is a research topic that I, I love, I really like. Um, and um, so the winner-loser gap literature is, is very, like, is immense. Like there is so much work on this and it has been proven in so many countries that the um, supporters of parties that end up in government are happier with the election result. They are, um, they show higher level of satisfaction with democracy, higher perceived legitimacy after the election. But what I noticed is that what was missing from the existing literature is really a definition or a, a study about who are the election winners. So who feel as an election winner after the election? So we sort of like assumed and fair enough that supporters or those who voted for the party that end up in government would feel election winners. But actually what I found is that also supporters of smaller parties can feel election winner. When their party have exceeded expectation or when there was a, a significant improvement in the vote share or seat share compared to the previous election. And for that, I leverage primarily originally uh, data uh, collection and survey experiment. And what is also nice to see and interesting to, to notice that the winner loser gap also extend to election for the European Parliament, not only at the national level. But I promised you I would also talk a little bit about my ERC project, and I do this with um, extreme uh, pleasure. The, and hence the title of the entire presentation for today, The Meanings of Voting for Ordinary Citizens. I got this um, 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 ERC grant in 2020, and I started in January 2021. And the idea within this project is to study voters' conceptualization, how they see voting, how they interpret the term voting. Where did this idea come from? So the idea of studying the meanings of voting for citizens is from um, 
first and foremost, the realization that there is a global pattern of declining turnout across many countries. This is a graph that I borrowed from Costel Canble 2021. And you see in the graph that there is a general decline in electoral participation across many, many countries. At the same time, so in simultaneously with this decline in voter turnout, there is a um, um, there's an increasing narrative around um, um, more and more protest, the rise of authoritarian leaders. And so sort of like electoral democracy in, put into question about how important is still voting for citizens? How do citizens um, see voting? Now, the existing literature about turnout and voting behavior is huge. We know so much about it. We know we, we're perhaps not particularly good at predicting turnout and predicting vote choice, but we know um, quite a lot about the factors that would explain turnout and vote choice, such as self-interest, moral values, party identification, um, ex expression, and so forth and so on. We, are, we also know that there are factors that mediate the relationship between these factors and vote choice, the election campaign, the media, etc. What we don't know is how voters, how people see voting. And I wanted to study this for several reasons, and I can mention three. First and foremost, because I think it's intellectually interesting just to know about it, because we know so much about voting, and I also want to know um, how people would define voting. Second, because knowing about this would allow us to test the correlation with existing theories of voting behavior at turnout. So would allow us to see, is that true that people vote out of a sense of duty? <clears throat> is that true that party identification might drive voting behavior more than something else? We can test the correlation with these theories. And finally, because there is so much discussion about electoral democracy being in trouble today, and I wanted to know whether this is, this is also related to the institutions of voting, voting as an institution. Hence the research question of my project, does the mark that citizens leave on the ballot paper carry deep and substantive meaning for them? How do these citizens' perception vary across individuals, groups, and countries. Um, and um, is, this, is that true that electoral democracy is today um, experiencing these challenges? Um, how do we do, so I say we because I'm not alone, of course, I'm doing this with my team. Um, the entire project relies first and foremost on, on an open-ended inquiry. We just ask, our respondent to define voting as extensively as they want. We don't impose any close-ended question. We don't impose any scale or anything on them. Just tell us uh, what does voting mean to you. Now, I, footnote, I regret that I, I, I use the word meaning in this question because we cover 15 languages in the project and just translating this meaning is a bit awful, uh, but anyway. That's what we asked. Um, we did this in 13 countries uh, spanning liberal democracies like Sweden, US, um, going to countries in Latin America, Africa, etc. And we collected nearly 1 million words about the meanings of voting. And we are looking at them inductively and deductively. And we are just, I'm just a survivor of two years of manual coding <laughs> together with a bunch of coders and translator. Happy I made it here actually. Um, now, we'll, we first want to study the meanings of voting typology that exist, and then we want to study the causes and consequences of these meanings. Now, for the short time I have available today, I can't talk about all the causes and consequences. I mean, I would love to, but I leave these for future presentations maybe. So I'm just um, showing you a bit about the typologies we discovered thus far. But before I do that, I want to mention two things. The first is that these are, like I truly believe that these are not just 
So like I'll show you six typologies, but these are not just the only typology that might exist. There, there might be more and we are open to discoveries, but this is the ones that we um, found thus far. <coughs> the second thing that I'd like you to keep in mind while I show you the typologies um, is that people can hold them simultaneously. And in fact, they do. So it's not just that if someone is A, it cannot be B. So the first meaning typology, and I'll start with a very simple one, is like that there is no meaning. There is indeed a possibility. Like this will be the respondent that says no, none, or nothing. Now we don't know why they say no, not nothing. They might be just lazy, but uh, we we conservatively put in them into this category because they just say nothing or none. The next typology, and this is actually the one that we find um, it, the least, the most common one, is this instrument. What we call instrumental meanings of voting. Um, this is seeing voting as a, as a way of achieving something directly or loosely related to specific consequences, and the vote is above all a mean to such ends. This is not just strategic voting, so try to influence the formation of the government or elect a representative. It can also be like very naive type of instrumentality. I vote because I want a better country or because I want to improve um, a road in my town. Yeah? The second typology is what we call the expressive meanings of voting. This is view voting as a way to express identification with or a preference for a party ideology or policy. This can also be um, exp uh, like negative expression when I want to use vote to express my protest, my dissatisfaction with politics. The difference here with the instrumental meanings of voting is that such expression is fulfilled at the time of the vote, regardless of the consequence um, or regardless of the outcome of the election. The next typology is the ethics meanings of voting. This is also something we find in, 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 in the literature, this idea that someone votes out of a duty, um, a moral obligation, so I'm a good citizen and that's why I vote. The next typology is this allegiance meanings of voting. This is not, um, there is not so much space in the existing literature about this, but I found this quite fascinating is, is seeing voting as a commitment to the political system and its institution, voting to defend and support democracy. This also includes the voting because one has the right to do so. The last meaning typology is what we label anti-meaning. We are actually thinking about changing the label here. We're thinking about counter-meaning. Maybe you have, you have a better idea. We just cannot find a label uh, for these. But what we find um, is that there is, a, there is a group of citizens that um, have a meaning. So they provide an answer to us, but they um, they see voting as inconsequential, unpleasant, difficult things to do. This is not necessarily just negative, it can also be just, um, I don't understand. I'm unable to vote because I don't understand, I cannot choose. Yeah, so this expression, and that's why we think that anti-meaning might not be the best label. It's more sort of like counter-meaning to a voting. Now, how much of these meanings we find of um, instrumental meanings are the most diffuse ones, but we see also a lot of uh, what we call naive instrumentality. So not really just strategic voting. Allegiance are the second most diffuse meanings of voting, but they're very powerful. This allegiance is also the type of um, uh, meanings of voting that correlates more highly with turnout. Um, and participation in politics. And it's followed by expressive meanings of voting and ethics. We find that only about 5% of respondents in our sample do not possess a meaning of voting, but one needs to take into account that any question about voting suffers from social desirability. And so people that says no, none or nothing are relatively few, maybe also for this reason. 
and about 70% of are this untimed meaning. Country level explain some of the variation we see in these meanings. For example, countries with um, stable democracies have more allegiance voting compared to electoral autocracies like Turkey or Nigeria or Tunisia. Uh, we also find uh, that compulsory voting system differ compared to those who have no mandatory rules for voting and compulsory voting system have higher level of allegiance um, um, meanings. But overall individual level explanation seems to matter more. And I'm talking about age, education, but also things like trust and um, um, partisanship, for example, correlate quite highly with the type of vote one hold. Um, we also find that these meanings of voting are pretty stable. They do not tend to change over a period of about three or four months. But we study both meanings of voting in general and meanings of voting in a specific election. And what we find is that meanings of voting in a specific election do instead tend to change in the span of the election campaign. For example, what we see, and I find this quite interesting, is that uh, instrumental meanings of voting are more present just before the election, and then people tend to express more, um, um, uh, give us more expressive meanings after the election. So we find also much more negativity in the meanings of voting when we ask about the meanings of voting in a specific election compared to meanings of voting in general, which also tells that um, like voting as an institution is more positively seen compared to voting in a specific election. Also, we see that meanings are held in combination, so positive and negative can, can coexist, but expressive and instrumental are negatively correlated. Finally, we also find that meanings um, correlate with political participation, not only turnout, but also, uh, for example, the willingness to engage in protest or online um, engagement more generally. What um, are the more sort of like the broader takeaway, I think, from the project thus far? I mean, we still have two years to go. Manual coding is done, but there is still quite a lot to do. Um, but thus far, what I've learned and what I think is also valuable in terms of the entire discipline is to really focus on, to refocus on citizens. I mean, what we notice when we compare, for example, our questions about the meanings of voting using closed-ended question and open-ended question is that we get almost nothing from the closed-ended question. Like these powerful narratives that we get from the open-ended questions um, is the type of information that you will only be able to, to, to have once you really want to listen to what the respondent have to say. And that's, that's my, this is also a warning for myself that I work with closed-ended question all the time. And then really this waking up moment and saying, okay, maybe we're missing quite a lot. Because I have this feeling that like, and I don't know how hard it will be to publish all this, but you know, there is so much focus on the methods and the methodology that we kind of like lose focus about um, what we're studying, like the, 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 import, the importance of what we're studying. And I think the project also, and I hope later uh, with the forthcoming book based on the project, is to reshape a little bit about the, the, a little bit the narrative about electoral democracy being, being in trouble. Because what is clear, if you look at these meanings of voting, is that for people voting is really important. So like they don't reject the institutions, but they do reject the actors. So the political parties and the candidates. Um, we're now in the process of writing a series of papers and doing quite a bit of research about, as I mentioned before, the causes and the consequences of these meanings. In particular, I'm looking at, for example, the willingness to accept compromise in democratic settings and a perception of election integrity and how this relates to how people see voting, but also, we're working now on outgroup voting delegitimization. So this is, um, I think, a quite newer concept about how, not only how you see 
voting for yourself, but so it's, it's not just like how you conceptualize your voting, but also how you see uh, the outgroup voting. So what what do you think the outgroup is using the voting for? Um, and how this relates to the acceptance of the election outcomes. Finally, I want to conclude by saying that yes, it is about the giants like Jean Blondet, but it's also about our mentors, colleagues and co-authors. And in fact, all I talk to you today, it's all not just my work, but um, I've been fortunate enough to have amazing mentors, colleagues and co-authors that have helped me in this journey and the founders uh, that give material support and also important because I mean, um, without the money, <laughs> uh, some of this research would not be possible indeed. Thanks a lot. That's all I have and um, deeply appreciate your time. Thanks a lot. Really uh, impressive, Carolina. Thank you so much.